Oh. So, hello. Um, this is kind of embarrassing, but I don't actually know your name apart from the acronym. I think it's Stephen. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, Stephen Fackler. Okay. <laughs> so I'm here with S. Fackler. Uh, <laughs> and he is a member of the Libs team. Uh, and I, I, I know you're a user of asynchronous IO. Yes. Yeah. Here, although I don't know exactly what you're doing with it. I know you've also been working on, I mean, like long supported the uh, open SSL crate and a few other notable crates. Um, yeah. How are you using async IO actually? Yeah, so um, in a couple places. Um, one um, is uh, I just cut a release of the uh, Tokyo Postgres crate uh, that's been rewritten for async await. Um, so that's one big bit of code that uses async. Um, also at work, uh, I work on uh, a Rust uh, web server, and so um, it's not using any of the like the like Tide or um, you know uh, Rock or any of those. It's just a kind of homegrown framework on top of Hyper. Um, but then, but then that uses um, async await in there. Although all of our handler code is blocking all the networking glue and rate limiting, all that kind of thing is is all um, in the async world. Okay. Um, all right, cool. And the reason I specifically wanted to talk to, to you is that I was reading over the async or, you know, I've been talking over what are the things, what are the things we can do to increase interop between executors and different runtimes? Um, and, you know, one of the most obvious immediate steps is stabilizing traits that allow people to interrupt. And probably top of the list is stream, async read, and async write, right? Yeah. Async write to me. That sounds right to you, I guess. Yep. Um, and uh, of those three, like I talked a lot with Taylor, Kramer TJ about, you know, his concerns around stream, but I think it's more or less, it's relatively uncontroversial, but async read and async write, um, there is some major discussion happening around the best design. Right? Uh, and actually, it occurs to me, I don't know how much, it's probably a good idea for us to like briefly go over what, maybe I'll, I'll give you my view and you tell me sure. where, where, how, where it's missing. Um, so like, as I understand it, the traits today are, I don't know, there's probably a poll in here. Or look, they look kind of, they're kind of analogous. I guess the right place to start is where that is. We have the read trait, the synchronous read trait in a standard IO. And it looks something like this, uh, where it returns, it, it returns, it takes in a buffer to write data into, and it tells you if it got an error, and if not, how much data it actually wrote, right? Um, and the async version is kind of the same, except that, uh, except that, oh wait, I'm not sharing the screen. Hold on. Sorry, world. <laughs> Two viewers. Also you. <laughs> also Steven. Okay. Now you can probably see what I'm typing better. You may have had it open anyway. But um, So, right. And so the async version is essentially the same, except that it returns this poll thing. Um, so that it returns, you know, either it returns not ready or else if it's ready, it, it has a result. Um, and the concerns with this specifically have to do with, well, there's actually two concerns, I think. But the one that seems most prominent has to do with this buffer argument. Um, and specifically, it right now, according to sort of LLVM, I don't know, for a variety of reasons that we can dig into, you're not allowed to give an uninitialized buffer here. So in principle, all what you expect this, someone who implements this trait is that they're just going to write into this buffer. But, and so in principle, it doesn't matter what's in it when you give it to them, they're gonna overwrite it with something new. However, and you would like to be able to pass in uninitialized data therefore for efficiency, but the Rust uh, type system, at least today, requires that if you have an in, and mute reference, then it has to ref it has to refer to initialized memory, right? And accessing uninitialized memory is kind of 
just instant UB. And one of the dangers here is we can't guarantee if, if the implementation only writes to that buffer, then everything's okay. But if they should read from it, we can't stop them from doing, then they would trigger UB. Right. Uh, additionally, um, we need you need to make sure that the returned um, bytes read is correct, or else then they trigger you to read UB data. That's a good point. So yeah, so there's two, or there's like two concerns. There's two concerns I haven't gotten to the second one yet, but the first one is uninitialized memory, and the point is essentially this this buffer has to be today has to be zeroed, or at least initialized. Um, for two reasons, you're saying. One of them is the implementer of read may read from it. And the other is that the implementer of read may miss, I don't wanna put it so negatively, may lie to you, I wanted to say, but they may make have a bug <laughs> and <laughs> indicate that they initialized n bytes when in fact they did not. Um, so if you, then the point is then if you then go to read that data that they supposedly wrote, you might be doing yeah. And both these things they can do without any unsafe blocks in particular. Uh, um, so, right, there's, and this kind of bottoms out in the fact that the Rust type system, when you make a mutable reference, it's supposed to have been initialized, which would make both of these things not so bad. I mean, they might still be bugs, but they're not on a defined behavior. Um, Actually, I want to circle back to that at some point because one of the things I read in the thread I found pretty interesting around some of the implications beyond just safety guarantees. Um, but the other concern I've heard is around vector rights. And, and actually, I don't, well, I, I guess I'll repeat it since I'm doing it. Um, there's another method we didn't talk about. I don't remember what the signature looked like offhand. Oh, I can fill it in for you. Okay. Uh, but basically, the idea is you give a, you don't give just one buffer, you give a, a slice of buffers or something, right? A series of buffers that can be written into. Yep. And uh, the IO vec mute type is uh, carefully designed to be compatible with the um, low level C interface uh, so that you can take advantage of, uh, like in Linux or Windows, um, being able to say, hey, I want to do a read, and I don't have one buffer, I have like one over here and one over here, and fill this one and then fill that one. Yep. And there's a similar design for async read, I take it. Oops. But, but the, the poll version of this or something. Yep. And here I think the controversy comes around the default implementation of these methods, right? Um, which essentially says the idea is you don't need to implement this, but what we do is if you don't, I think we just give you the zeroth buffer, essentially. Uh, the first not empty buffer. Okay, first not empty buffer, sure. Um, and the idea here is like, you've given me a lot of buffers to use, but there's no obligation for me to use them, so it's safe for me to just ignore them. Of course, that's not so efficient now because maybe you had a really small buffer. Mm -hmm. or something. Um, yeah, and so the, the concern I saw there was basically that people often forget to, I think it comes down to people often for, maybe it's twofold. One is people often forget, but maybe also sometimes they just can't. Mm -hmm. Uh, like maybe I think I saw OpenSSL cited as an example of something that doesn't offer a vectored interface. Yeah, yeah. So like OpenSSL is one example. Like a, like a compression adapter would be another example of like if you're talking to libflate, it may not support simultaneous compression from multiple buffers. Right, and in that case, you kind of would prefer to know it. You might prefer to know at a higher level if vectoring is going to be efficient or not. Like it can always be emulated, but it can't necessarily be emulated efficiently. And you might adapt your, if, if it's not going to be efficient, you wouldn't use it in short. Yeah. And so as an example, Hyper actually does that, where it will um, auto detect if you don't support vectored writes, it'll then switch modes and copy everything into, into, into one big buffer. Yeah. Um, okay. So Hyper actually does this. That was going to be my first question. Yeah. That seems like the kind of thing that I, you know, 
I guess if I, I certainly wouldn't want to write code like that. It just sounds a lot more complex. But I guess if you were sort of writing both modes anyway, you might, it's probably not too much work. Yeah, it's kind of a thing where if you're doing vectored writes, you're either in some mode where you can't allocate and so you have, you can't, you know, move stuff around or you're doing really hardcore performance tuning, in which case you really want to deal with both nodes up front. Um, one now, disadvantage of the current world is that you can't just ask, is vectoring worth it? You have to like try it and find out. Hmm. Now, one thing that's, and how do you find out? You just sort of observe that they're not using your buffers very often or something? Yeah, I would imagine probably, I haven't looked at Hyper's code, but I imagine it's something like if, you know, we try this and it only reads, it, if it reads exactly the entire first buffer, we assume it's not, you know, it doesn't support it or something. Yeah. That sounds plausible. Um, so one thing you will note about these, of course, is that they both apply equally well <laughs> to the synchronous and the asynchronous case. Uh, and so maybe we can talk a little more. So you prepared this document, mm -hmm. the IO buffer initialization, that kind of goes into some of the alternatives. I don't know if we want to go through them. I don't know how much we do. People should look at it, perhaps. What I'm kind of curious about is, it seemed to me when I skimmed it that there wasn't really like a great, <laughs> there wasn't one that stood out as like, yeah, that's the easiest, best path. Um, but there were some that almost did. Yeah, uh, I think the last one described um, of like working with a type that tracks initialization to me feels like the best option. Um, okay. Well, let's, let's come over, I guess, some of them. So there's trusted read, so I don't actually remember what all the options were. Yeah, so trusted read is uh, in the same way that we have for iterators, like exact len, uh, or like trusted exact size, or whatever it's called. It's an unsafe trait that says, I implemented read, but actually I am willing to guarantee that I didn't screw it up. And then via specialization, you could optimize for, this is not a broken reader, I can use uninitialized memory. Um, yeah, okay, so the idea here would be, let me put this in a separate tab so I can switch, switch back. I see. So the idea would be that you have, you have something like, I'm gonna do the optimizing though. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna have a function foo that works for any read, and in here I'm gonna, you can't actually do this, but you could do it with sufficiently clever. Um, abstractions, you're going to kind of say if, oops, that should be read, if D is actually trusted read, then skip zeroing, or I guess it'd be more like if you didn't implement trusted read, zero the buffer. <laughs> um, yeah. um, the problem, as you point out, is that that works as long as you know what the type is, but if you have a DIN type, that doesn't work so well. But you could also, specialization is like indefinitely far from stabilization. So, right, that's also true. Um, so, I think there actually might be a strategy that worked with DIN, uh, but it would require. The idea would be that we, hmm, you would have to move the method kind of into the trait. Yep. Uh, you see what I'm kind of getting at? Yeah, or like you could have like an attempt to downcast a trusted read method or something like that. Oh, okay. So yeah, so yeah, there are a number of ways, I guess, yeah. in short. You could kind of make a, uh, the obvious way would be to say something like this, <laughs> where the default is no, or you know what I mean? And yeah. then and then you're, then you're actually calling through the V table. So the, what I was going to suggest was probably like, Uh, I don't know what signature you want, but you know. Oh, sure. Yeah, that would work. The problem there though is, is that if you're working with a trait object, you then have to decide, am I working with a read or a trusted read? Yeah, you have to downcast what you would have. You could take in a, yeah, it'd be annoying. There's, there's various annoying things. There should be some way to do that, but it would be hard. Uh, I don't actually know that that's possible. 
I guess what you'd want to do is add to the read trait something that casts itself to a DIN, a DIN trusted read, right. uh, appropriate DIN trusted read. That's a pretty smelly method though. Yeah, it's all getting kind of complicated. Yeah. If we had better downcasting, I guess, be plausible, which we don't. So, okay, so trusted read is like maybe, but it needs some language features we don't really have and it's not entirely obvious that it's gonna work. Yep. Um, freeze, so freeze here, the idea is, well, you want, maybe you can talk about it. Yes, the idea with freeze is that um, the problem with uninitialized memory is that it is not just a bag of bytes, right? It is actually in an undefined state, which is not the same thing as an arbitrary but defined state, which means that if you read from it, the value you get is undefined. It can change over time. The compiler will like remove your entire function, all the bad stuff you get with undefined behavior. And the idea with freeze is to say like, no compiler, this is a bag of bytes. Um, and so it goes from undefined bytes to defined but arbitrary, to defined like whatever was there before. And these, this sort of not really exists in LLVM, but it doesn't exist. The problem is here we need to go, we don't actually want to freeze the reference. We want to freeze the memory the reference refers to. Yep. Um, yeah, and so I actually had a PR open to implement this intrinsic. Uh, it would lower to an ASM block that took in the argument to make it opaque to LVM. Um, I think LVM has been talking about adding an actual uh, operation for this. I don't think it exists yet, though. Um, but um, there are some. There's a a particular fundamental issue with this approach um, for in at least the context of buffer initialization for read. Um, and that problem is that it is not the case that the hardware has a fixed but undefined value for that for that buffer in all cases. Um, and in particular, the Linux kernel has this um, memory mode called MAD free uh, that's designed for use by allocators where you're saying, hey, I don't care about the contents of this memory now uh, anymore. You yeah. are welcome to free it and fill it with and fill it with zero pages if you need to at some point in the future. And that point is arbitrarily far until you write to it again, and then it locks it in place. And so you can be in a world where you have your buffer of uninitialized memory, you freeze it. So according to the compiler, it's some fixed value. But according to the OS, it can start out being non-zero and then become zero later. And so you can still have values under a shared reference changing. Right, so, so for this to work, we would either have to disable and add free. I don't even know if you can do that. Or we would have to like write one byte per memory page or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So writing a byte per page would be probably the solution. Um, but there are, it, it feels like we're, it, like my concern with this is that it feels like we're flying too close to the sun. Of like, this is the one weird OS thing that we know about so far that would have caused problems here. And to work around that, we need to like figure out the size of an OS page on all, on all of our supported targets. Um, and then write to it. But on top of that, writing to one byte per page is actually a really expensive operation in certain contexts, especially when you're working with big buffers, right? Where it's like, hey, I don't know how big my buffer needs to be. I'm just gonna make it 16 megabytes. Right. And because the OS will like demand zero page, the cost of that is like pretty much zero until you actually start writing. Right. Um, so three writes to everything, then that allocation becomes actually 16 bytes, not like, Theoretically, 16 by uh, 16 megabytes. Yeah, I mean, it feels a little bit like this was designed for a reason. Like, and that free. Yeah, like the point, like, like they built it this way because they wanted to be peak efficient, and you're not supposed to be reading that memory. In other words, we're kind of working around this optimization rather than enabling the optimization. Right, like that, often, uh, like that, that feature was designed for a world in which it is undefined to read, it's, it's undefined behavior to read uninitialized memory. And so we can go off and do weird things in the background, right? Right. Yeah, and, and I guess all I'm saying is, I would kind of like us to be able to take advantage of that feature. That seems like a useful feature. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and like, otherwise and like, C++ is gonna be just that much faster or whatever. Right. Yeah, and like the reality is that it's used in practice by uh, Jay Malloc, for example. And so I think there's a talk from some Facebook folks about them running into bugs in production because they tried to pull this freeze trick and their allocator uh, started using MAD free pages. Ah, oh, well, so there you go. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. <laughs> it's a nice feature, but also causing problems in practice. 
the one one other thing I saw in the thread that I I thought was interesting, and I don't know too much of the details, was um, that you know basically that there are real security potential security issues with even if it you know that it's initialized, it could still be memory you prefer that the implementation not read. And I think I saw Heartbleed mentioned. Maybe you could talk a little about that. Yeah, right. So the idea here, right, is that like when you when you you allocate a buffer, you use it for some stuff, and then you free it. Your allocator is not going to delete, is not going to zero those pages out unless you're like you know running in debug mode or something, right? Um, and so when you allocate that memory again, unless you ask for it to be zeroed, it'll have some whatever bytes were in there, like before, like when you used it last. Right. And if those bytes were like your you know private key or something, then a screw up. In some re, you know, in some read implementation where it, you know, returns the wrong value, can cause that those private key bytes to be sprayed out to who knows where. Now, so I'm kind of, I don't know. I guess I'm kind of conflating two things here. Where another, I don't know if it's in your document, but another proposed solution to this problem is basically don't solve the problem, but use buffer pools or some other way to. Uh, just not have uninitialized memory and not have that be expensive. Um, but, and that, that certainly, then the counter argument is kind of, well, that's still run, you're still, it's still not an optimal solution because, right. but the, when you just spoke that out loud though, it sounds a little like, I don't know, I guess it's mitigating. It's true that we are mitigating the risk of put it this way. It's true that we don't want the read implementations to be reading from this buffer. And it's potentially bad if they do so. But it's also true that you should probably be zeroing out your private keys before you free the memory or something. If you like, like we're not stopping all possible readers here. There's lots of them. Right. That's uh, kind of my opinion is that you should, if you care, if you should be zeroing secret, like securely zeroing secrets. Um, if you care about them, because this is like one of like an arbitrarily large number of ways that like right. you could lose that if it's just lying around in main memory forever. Um, and so I'm, yeah, and so like the problem I'm trying to solve is the um, like the undefined behavior part. And my kind of view is that if you're in this world of being worried about leaking secrets, you should either be careful and zero them or just zero all your buffers before you use them. Yeah, that's kind of I found that, yeah, I think I agree with that. Like, it seems like that's kind of a non sequitur here, or not exactly a non sequitur, but it's not the strongest consideration. Well, like there are ways to harden your program to do this, right? Like you can tell your allocators zero all pages when free. Right, or you could have your, yeah, you could have your buffer pool and you could have some way to flag it and say like, yep. this contains sensitive data, you should zero this one, even if you don't zero all of them. Yep. Um, uh, so, Okay, let's let's keep going then. Otherwise, we'll be talking about this forever. So, new read method. Uh, I see. Yeah. Okay. So we could add some. This is a little bit like the trusted read method that I was sort of half proposing. Yeah. Right. So the remainder of these are basically saying we're going to add a new method on the read trait um, that has a more robust way of working with uninitialized inputs. And. I mean, this signature is definitely like scarier. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess when I see this thing, so, so what's going on here for those of you who may not be so probably able to tell what's going on. Which the fact that I have to explain it is already evidence of, of a problem, but um, yeah. like now we're saying these bytes may or may not be initialized, which is this union thing. And then we're, we're returning a slice of the memory which does not have that type. So we're kind of giving evidence that we actually did initialize it, or at least we needed to use unsafe code to do so. Um, which is also a little like, I guess you're gonna probably use unsafe code somewhere in your read method, but it feels like it's somehow sensitive. Uh, but I mean, I, my, my, the other concern here is just, this assumes a usage pattern. Like, can I say, if you had, I may not be immediately processing these bytes. They might be in some vector. And now I only get, I have to kind of transmute my slice into this maybe uninit and then 
I get back a reference handle that can only be used within the stack frame where I actually made the read to call and maybe I want to pass it further back up. And that's where the read occurs. Um, and what happens if my reader returns me a slice that isn't a reference into my buffer? Uh, yeah, know, or yeah. even a reference in the head of the buffer, I'm trying to you know, keep a cursor going. Right. Um, so signature seems like a non There's the that a weird implementation could use here uh, that I think people would potentially miss, right? Because the case of like, I have a cursor of like the stuff that's been written to and I want to bump that forward, that suddenly becomes pretty complex in this world, especially because you can't compare, you can't determine if that, if that buffer comes from the original allocation and make a Yeah. Yeah, and even, so, so basically, even if they do what you expect, it's probably limiting, but they might not do what you expect. That's yeah. worse. Um, um, but I think there's a more significant issue with this style of function, um, that this approach fails, but some others can deal with more, more robustly, is that the way you've written it, right, is just read to method semicolon, right, which means that implementers have to implement it. We can't do that. So you right. have to have a default in here. And with this implementation, or with this definition rather, um, we have to delegate to read. But the only way we can do that is by taking our maybe un uninitialized buffer, initializing the entire thing and passing it down. Yeah. Um, but that's really scary because as I mentioned before, like uh, you, know, you will commonly use very large buffers and write to very little of them. And you now end up with like this kind of like weird n squared thing where yeah. you zero your 16 meg buffer every time you read 15 bytes from the underlying, from the, from the inner reader or something like that. Yeah, no, it's, it's like, it's the problem we're trying to avoid and it's worse because it's repeated. Yeah. Right. It's repeated and yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's a non-starter, but that is an important point. We'll come back to, I think this sort of delegation, especially if Tokyo kind of adopts a different approach than the standard library or something, then we want to talk about how they interoperate. Yep. Um, okay, so buff mute. Yeah, so um, this is what um, like Tokyo 01 used, uh, and like the buff tree is still part of the bytes crate. And it's kind of a combination. Uh, it, it's a trait that works in the same way, roughly, that the vectored IO, like the IO slice to, uh, mute type is, where it's, you know, you pass in some type implementing buff, that can be one slice, a bunch of slices, uh, slices, and it also folds in uh, APIs to work with the bytes uninitialized or not uninitialized. Um, but it still has that same problem as read as the read to thing above, where you have that default that has to delegate to read, and it has to zero the bytes. Okay, yeah. So the idea is roughly that we we add a buff mute trait that lets you work with uninitialized or potentially initialized yep. memory and also, and also non-contiguous slices. It's kind of all folded together, which is one kind of nice advantage of it. Yeah, that is an advantage. Uh, although, I guess I don't know how it's, if it solves the question of like, wanting to ask whether, like wanting to use a different strategy if the underlying implementation right. can't just make use of yeah, that would be a different method, but like that's not too complex. That's, relatively that's just a new method on read that's like, do you have vectored IO support? Right, and you just say yes or no. Yeah, yeah. that's not really a big deal in any of these. Um, so then the other concern with this is um, is around object safety. Read has to, mirror, has to remain object safe. Uh, we, the method could just take a dying, buff, a dying mute buff mute, um, or should it have a generic method with some like shim code to go from uh, you know parameterized to non, this seems like there's a couple of concerns, right? One is, maybe you already said this and I just missed it, but you have the original, this is still a read to method, right? Yep. Um, so, okay. So this would be like the most obvious version and then you're saying, yeah, you could also have like a, something. Right, like, you know, because like, especially if you are, there, right, there are readers that do a ton of tiny little reads of like, I need the next four bytes to parse an ant, I need the next eight bytes to parse along. Um, right. And so a trade object may actually be like concretely a performance problem here. Um, so you may need to have a parameterized and unparameterized version. And if you're like very careful, you might be able to make them forward in the right way. Um, yeah. Right, so that's gonna basically the problem is now we're gonna have 
virtual calls for every byte that you write, at least. They may get optimized away a lot of the time, but that's the sort of unoptimized, naive semantics. Yep. Right. I'm not sure if you can, yeah, maybe you can set up some forwarding thing like, I'd have to think about it. I don't know. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. I'm taking it this is not your preferred solution yet. It is not. Yeah. Okay. Um, we can, blah, blah, blah. yeah, and there's the zeroing problem in that too. Yes, right. So here is the 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 solution that I personally think is the best approach, um, given that we need to be backwards compatible, right? Um, so like the choice for like Tokyo, I was I was I was I was talking with Carl about this, and the choice for Tokyo now is like the trade-offs are different there than they are for Stood because Tokyo doesn't care about back compat necessarily with the stuff they had before, so they can do things like not have a default implementation. Um, but we can't, and so I think this, um, especially given that, is like the best way forward. Yeah, we should talk, let's talk about backwards. Let's talk about the different compatibility requirements for read, async read, and Tokyo's async read, but let's not talk about them yet. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> put them on the stack. So this, this solution is basically we introduce I mean, it looks like we're introducing kind of like, instead of a trait, buff moot, we're introducing a struct yep. for encapsulating a slice of potentially undefined bytes. We can make it ergonomic, you know, to like, we can, we can hide the transmutes for you if you happen to have one you know is initialized. Um, and how is this more compatible than Right. So the key point here, like if you think back to the first read to method where it took in a maybe an init U8 slice and returns a U8 slice. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems there was that like repeated full buffer initialization in the, in the delegation. And the key part here is that this read buff, it knows how much has been written to so far. And so you can just say when you're doing the delegation, make sure this whole thing's been initialized. And the first time you call that it has to zero the whole buffer. But after that, it knows, oh, no, the buffer's been written to, we're good to go. I see. And it can also know, I mean, I guess that was probably, I just skimmed over it when scrolling through this code. But if you've given it, right, if you give it a fully initialized buffer, it knows that. Right. So if you're working with, like, if you have a buffer pool or whatever, so that you don't care, you don't care. <laughs> um, it's still the case. Oh, I see. And even better, you're saying, so we still have to write this default code is going to force initialize the vector. So you still probably want all your layers to implement this new method. Yep. Like if you happen to be using some older release, it may be technically compatible from a Sember point of view, but it's going to be inefficient. Yeah, that's somewhat, un that's I think pretty unavoidable in that like, this is the only method that can deal with, with uninitialized bytes. And so right. if you're chained it forward, then you're hosed. Seems um, like that, that's just inherent. Like, yeah. any Sember compatible thing is going to funnel through the old method. The old method required initialized bytes, therefore, they're going to get initialized somewhere along the line. Yeah. Um, but, like, one of the reasons that uh, in, like, Tokyo 01, for example, they have read and read buff, and read buff is the one that is generic over, over buff mute, and it delegates to read. And that one, and there were issues there where it was, like, pretty catastrophic there if you didn't forward. Because mm -hmm. there it's the full buffer, it's like the n squared problem. And we avoid that here. Okay, so you have to forward, but let me try to take a few notes so I can remember later what we said. Uh, you have to forward, but you will only zero once in the worst case. Hence, no less efficient, let's say, than it was before. Um, and if everyone implements, it's fine. Uh, I guess I didn't quite catch, you're saying in the Tokyo, it's, it's some iteration of the bytes creator and earlier Tokyo traits, the forwarding was really inefficient. Is that because it, of the use of the trait or why was that? Oh, it was, it was inefficient because it, because the buff mute trait uh, doesn't retain the memory of, how, of if it's been initialized so far or how much has been. And so it has to do call read, Zero sixteen megabytes. Call read zero sixteen megabytes, etc. Yeah, the the trait version of this can't retain the memory 
Yeah, it seems like this is actually a like side note. It's just an interesting observation on our our trade system that we don't sort of allow you at the moment to like lock in certain details of the implementation. Like you can't do this with a trait because it requires you to have some initialized field that you can use and a certain amount of trusted logic around that that knows the field isn't. That's basically all on safe code. It has to be validated. So using a struct lets us do that. Yeah, like you could add this. You'd probably need to make the trait unsafe um, and then just force every implementation to track this somehow. Right. It'd just be super um, annoying also. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, uh, one other, um, I, I just remember that this is maybe, maybe relevant for, for the API of this or some of the other approaches is the one other thing you have to worry about when you are when you have a read that somehow takes in a slice of maybe uninit U8 is that you also have to make sure the implementation doesn't uninitialize initialize parts of the buffer. Does that make sense? No. So um, if we think what? back to the first, to like that first read too, that takes in a maybe on an U8 and returns a you know, U8. Mm -hmm. Imagine we have a malicious implementation that takes the buffer, writes on an init to the entire thing, and then returns an empty slice. Then even parts of the buffer that the caller knew had data in them before, or assumes has data in them before, suddenly have undefined data. Yeah, I guess I'm like not, I had never thought about writing on init. <laughs> yeah, it's a kind of subtle thing that like uh, makes APIs that assume like the, right. There, yeah. there, there have been some APIs somewhere I can't remember where that like had troubles because of that like weird behavior. Okay, but you're saying that you can't do this with this struct because it kind of guards its. It's not giving you direct access to that, but it is potentially, right? I yeah, well, so, right. So the API it provides is I will, I can give you a slice of U8s of the initialized head of the buffer mm -hmm. or a slice of maybe uninit U8s of the uninitialized tail of the buffer. But if you want a slice of maybe uninit U8 of the entire thing, that's an unsafe method. I see. So the caller says, I promise I'm not going to do dumb stuff here. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so also, it, yeah, so it sort of doesn't quote unquote solve that problem, but it at least puts an unsafe block in the way. Right. Also permits uh, us to use, so let me try to take some notes on this. So uh, basically permits us to avoid the evil, I don't know what you have the word for it, scenarios that plagued the like read to and mute maybe on an Mm -hmm. um, method and it does this basically by exposing APIs that are careful not um, and or and using unsafe functions for e.g. getting access uh, yeah, or marking APIs as unsafe if they can be misused to deinitialize already initialized memory or other such things. Um, I guess that's the main thing you have to be concerned about because you don't have the option of like returning a slice that didn't go along with your old the slice you were. Right. Like the kind of core unsafe bits here are getting a getting the full buffer slice so you can't deinitialize parts or doing like a set len style operation of like set Trust me, I've initialized the next 100 bytes. Those right. are like the two unsafe APIs. Yep, or declare memory initialized. Yeah, and that's good. I mean, having unsafe is a real, obviously important. And it lets us document the requirements pretty clearly. Mm -hmm. All right, so I see why you like this option. The main, so let's talk a little bit about the compatibility requirements, because I think that's an important thing. Um, and I'm kind of curious to get your opinion on this in general. So, there's a list of them in the Dropbox. Um, oh, okay. Maybe you mean something different than I do. But. Oh, sorry. Maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> but actually, what you're meaning, I think what you mean sounds also good. Let's talk about that first. Yeah. Is this the constraints yeah, you're referring yeah, it'd to? It'd be that constraints uh, section. Mm -hmm. Right. Let's hold on. So like, 
Right, it needs to be backwards compatible. Okay, we have, in other words, we have to somehow be able to funnel through read. It needs to be efficient. That's what we've already been talking about. It shouldn't like be any worse than zeroing the buffer exactly once, kind of. Compatible with din read, we talked about that. It needs to work with both normal and vectored IO. So in this case, I don't quite know how that fits in here. I guess you could extend this struct. Yes, yeah, so you'd have a read buff type and a read buffs type. So yeah, okay, so you'd like to have two methods. Yep. Like in principle, it could it could sort of paper over in a similar way to the tree. Yeah, yeah. So like having one inter one unified interface for, for both of those is is really nice. Um, but given that we already have two and there's a split, um, I think like the low level implementation can have this. And then you can build even third party, like an abstraction over that, right? Like you could make a like the bytes crate could add a redex trait that has read buff that delegates to the right method depending on if your buff implementation is vector, you know, has, is non-contiguous or not. Yeah, okay. So do we want vector, I see, so, so, okay. So one question would be, do we want the buff mute, the buff mute uh, struct to paper over vectorized operations. I don't know if that's the right term exactly, but, and your opinion is kind of, no, we should offer two methods and two structs and let some other abstraction kind yeah, of. Yeah, or like at least like no for now, right? Because there's like other stuff that we don't, right? Like there is no buffer, there, there is no vectored read exact, for example, or vectored read to end. I guess that would make sense. Like buffered read exact, for example, or buffered write all or a vector write all rather. And like, again, those are things that can be added later. But like the minimal low level building blocks would be just two methods with read buffs and read buff. Yeah, okay. I mean, it probably implies that we, it may imply that we want some kind of, uh, do I support vectored operation? method but anyway yeah i think i think like we do i think we should probably add one but that's oh kind of again like i'm not too worried about that because it's easy to add we should probably just do it yeah um okay uh, it needs to work with normal and vector bio okay it needs to be composable Eaters are commonly nested okay i mean it, this basically means uh, i think the answer in this case would just be you have to forward using this abstraction and that has to work okay. Yep. There's no real reason why that should be especially harder, I don't think. Yeah, I think it's just in there. I, I don't think any of the implementations off the top of my head run into that problem. It's just like one of the things to be aware of and like double check. Okay. And it needs to, it's some reasonable, and this is sort of what we covered about using the buff mute gives us the ability to expose on un, an a simple uninitialized buffer if that's what you want, but you have to write on safe to get access to that. Um, something I wanted to say about that. Oh no. Okay, that makes sense. So what I was gonna, what I meant by compatibility requirements was, was something slightly different. Uh, I meant maybe sync versus async versus Tokyo, right? So there's this premise that clearly sync read is what it is. It need, it, we need to have this, we're back, you know, we can add it to the trait, but it needs to fall back and it's going to be a sort of annoying thing where people have to add it and that's the way it is. Um, the async trait though isn't stable, uh, or it's not even existing in standard library yet, doesn't have that requirement. However, I think there's, I think there's a lot of value in having them be, you know, analogous. Um, I don't know exactly how fast we're going to move in either these, any of these cases. Um, basically, what I'm trying to figure out is, maybe you can kind of get the sense of it already. Like, do you think the ideal would be that we, I see a couple scenarios. One is we, we, we extend read buff mute. We agree that's a good solution, better than the current unstable solution we've got, which we didn't even talk about, but you don't have to. And uh, we then, make an async read trait that mirrors it exactly. That seems 
good because it's compatible, but less good. Or there's, I see some advantages and disadvantages, right? What it, the disadvantage seems to me that, that you probably don't want the default behavior to go that way. We probably would prefer it to go the other way. That, like, if if you offer, if you could go back in time, you either wouldn't have the end mute U8 method at all, or you would have it forward to the other one. Yep. Um, so it seems a little bit silly to make a trait that, that goes the other way. Uh, and on the other hand, the advantage would be that we could immediately add, <laughs> we could sort of immediately add the async read trait mirroring the read trait, and then have this debate about both traits together right, and move them in lockstep. Um, yep. Although I don't know how much, I guess there's some question about like maybe this debate is already over and we should just like, that seems yeah. to never be true though. If the yeah, question no, is, is the debate. Actually, I think this is like an, I think this is like an important question um, of like, you know, should we take the, op should we take advantage of the opportunity to like do the right thing this time? Or should we take our lumps, make the make the two traits look the same, which I think would probably match with expectations much better. Um, yeah. I think I would probably lean toward just like make them look the same. I uh, I lean that way, but oh, let me, let's let's spell it out because I want to know if I see some other alternatives. So we can either right. We can. This was the first thing I said. We can add async read now with the same methods as read. And then we can try to extend them both with buff mute simultaneously. Or we can sort of extend read with buff mute and then add async read with only buff mute probably, or maybe the and mute u8 that falls back to um, to the buff mute method. That seems kind of dumb, <laughs> but maybe it's convenient. I don't know. Just a convenience method. I mean, the, or, I mean, I guess there's like another way to skin this, which is we could leave read alone. <laughs> we could just add async read with buff mute. We could swap the order of these things, basically. There's no reason they have to be. Right. And the, the, a downside of this I see is uh, we combine the, async read and buff mute discussion a little bit where they could potentially be separated with a breaking change. I don't know how much this matters, but it is true that it will require a breaking change of futures IO crate. Like if we take this first path, we can release a minor version of futures IO that redirects to the standard library because the trade is literally the same. Um, I think, I don't know, I haven't, I haven't looked that closely. Maybe there's some other weird stuff in there we have to clear out. But, um, I don't know how much that matters. If I remember right, futures mirrors stood exactly even the unstable initializer method, uh, but I think it's flagged away so that it's okay to just like cut those out, switch it to the new signature. And yeah, that would be my main question was, was there some unstable stuff and how do we, what policy do we have on that? But, um, I think it just exactly mirrors stood. Uh, where minor, where like, it's a non-breaking change to break that interface. I guess these are really the only two options, right? Yep. Uh, I mean, the other option that I didn't even list is that we just add async read and we don't solve this problem. <laughs> uh, which, yeah, I'm sorry, like, yes, like I do at least not now, right? Which is kind of a subset of this first one. And, and there's an argument that maybe this problem isn't that important and it can wait a little longer, but. Yeah. So, yeah. In my view, these are like totally orthogonal problems, um, except that, and like the, like it's, this is basically a forcing function to make people think about the buffer initialization stuff again. <laughs> because the state of the world right now is that there's an unstable interface in the standard library, that the, in, the, in the standard library that relies on slices of uninitialized memory being valid which from the whisperings I hear from, un from the unsafe code guidelines folks is probably going to be true, but it's like pretty sketch. There's no way we can stabilize that without all of that, without, without a like a decision from there. Even then it's not a good interface. This is the interface for dealing with uninitialized memory you're saying? Yeah, so the current one is just, um, there's a method, basically you can get a method that says, okay, produce a slice of uninitialized memory 
the reader will tell you to initialize it or not, and then just feed it into the read method. Um, yeah. But it's like a little bit sketch, especially because of like the validity questions around mutable slices of uninitialized data. And that's sort of like, I assume this is right, right? There. It's okay as long as you don't read, rather. Yeah. Right. Sort of the C, C world. Yeah, and, but beyond that, like a lot of code in the real world does that. Um, not just in like, you know, in like async IO land, but also in like, you know, my OpenSSL bindings, it's a callback thing, right? So like you call read on the OpenSSL glue, it then calls read on your inner reader. It gives you the buffers. I have no idea if those things are initialized or not. They probably aren't, but I'm not zeroing them. Because it's just like not, because like the cost is just too brutal. <laughs> I'm saying lots of code is relying on it in practice anyway. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we're gonna make that assumption true if like we can do, but. Okay. Um, I'm trying to connect this, so I'm to figure out how this current interface relies on a semi-sketchy assumption, how that connects to, you view them as orthogonal problems, I agree. I guess one question about that, the current interface, if I understand it's some kind of like, basically you can ask the read trait for a preparation function, so to speak, yep. so like, bless my buffer, uh, and, and then you can use the buffer, and that by default zeroes it, but it could be overridden to be more efficient. Yep, um, yeah, and like um, the old Tokyo 01 interface had an equivalent thing that just, if you feed the buffer into it and it zeroes out if it has to. Oops. Sorry, uh, you feed the buffer in and it zeroes if it has to. Yeah, and what's, why you said it's a pain, what makes that more of a pain than buff mute, say? Um, oh no, it's not a pain, it's just like pretty dubious. Okay. Um, like the like like the type safety is just a little bit sketch. The other scary thing there is that you want that to be unsafe to implement, but right, the right. direction of unsafe methods is not that direction, and so yeah, that's annoying. That yeah. that that, is, that makes it a pain. Yeah. So you're saying the problem being that you want it to be unsafe to implement, but safe to call, and we don't we just don't give you that. That's not a thing you can do in Rust today. You can well, it actually it needs to be unsafe to call as well. Uh, or else in your implementation of it, you could call someone else's without writing any unsafe code. Um, but if they had to implement, if it was unsafe to implement always. Uh, oh yes, right, yeah. So it would have to be unsafe to implement. Yeah. That's just not a thing we have, unfortunately. Right. Um, okay. Uh, you can make traits, but not methods. So the question, the final question is Tokyo, right? If Tokyo were to, Depending on which route we go, my main concern here would be, like, I don't really care that much if Tokyo has its own async read and async write trait. That seems fine. But I do would like them to be interoperable. And uh, I haven't, maybe you have the right answer to this question of, like, which options, which combinations are disastrous from an efficiency point of view? <laughs> uh, in like, a, in like a shimming kind of sense? Yeah, so like for example, if we added async read that matches read today, if we did this first path, mm -hmm. and we didn't yet get to the buff mute thing, so that yep. for a while we have it just this one way, what would Tokyo have to do? There, guess, and then the question is, well of course, which trait do they adopt? But the danger would be that we end up in this scenario where when you try to use, like presumably, when you try to use Tokyo with the standard traits that it's like gets into this exponential zeroing where it's zeroing many times and becoming very inefficient. And that pushes you away from working interoperably towards like, well, I'm just gonna code directly to the Tokyo traits. Um, yeah, I think like depending on the direction, um, the version with like the bytes with like the, the, the read buff interface or whatever it is where it, where it tracks the initialization, I think can maybe be maybe able to avoid some of that problem just by like, if both ends remember know how to remember that the answer to that question, then you may be okay. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. But so, like, so, but uh, I don't want to speak for I don't want to speak for Carl and the other Tokyo people. But my but my 
what I kind of recall from talking with them is that like, there were two traits right now because people want to experiment with uninitialized memory in different ways. Uh, the futures version, the, 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 the futures version, you can't really use in practice because it needs nightly to do the uninitialized memory stuff. Um, right, because it forwards those, that unstable API. Um, and that basically if we have enough consensus to stabilize something in stud, then that means like the Tokyo folks are like, like, you know, like Sean, for example, are like their significant stakeholders in caring about buffer initialization. Um, sure. And so I think once they land, we can probably unify down to, even if they have different traits, the signature should be able to match up enough because the stood version is good enough that they'll all kind of forward properly, if that makes sense. Maybe not. I mean, I, it does. I think what you're saying is, I can't quite tell how much this is an article of faith or how much you've sort of worked out what it would be, but I think well, there's two ways to interpret what you just said. One of them is, if Tokyo lands something, we care about that, so we'll, we'll, we'll design around it. And the other is, the options that I think are on the table, like, should be compatible more or less with this buff mute struct or whatever approach we decide to take. Um, or maybe both are true. Uh, yeah, and I think like, yeah, it's like basically that like reaching consensus on a stable standard interface for buffer initialization um, kind of would have to mean that we've reached a good equilibrium with like third party code that wants to work with uninitialized buffers. Yeah, and so here's a question then. One of the things, so, okay, let me write down that sentence because that's a good one. Reach, <laughs> reaching consensus on on init memory in stud. Yeah, okay, would have, you're basically saying would take into account experiences from Tokyo yeah. by default. But one of the questions I had then is like, maybe twofold. First of all, how much consensus, this is your opinion, to what extent do you think that represents the opinion of other people in and around the Libs team? Do you know if any of them have engaged in this question? And finally, is there ways to gain experience that, like, one of the assertions that I think I saw made on the thread was sort of, we can't really tell how this, some of these things will perform and so forth until we sort of make a decision. It's too much work to, like, experimentally tinker with these traits. Um, you kind of have to build the whole ecosystem around it, and then it's too late to change it, which I think is probably true to a if you want to get a hundred percent level of confidence, but I would hope. Yeah, like I think um, so. For the for the for the um, for the se for the second question, I think you can gain a good amount of confidence by like we wouldn't just want to start like permuting and cutting like fifteen releases of Tokyo or whatever with like fifteen variants of this and seeing which one lands. That would just be a nightmare. Um, but just like cutting a branch, like making a git branch of Tokyo with those changes, updating hyper and various other crates to use those new interfaces, you know, as like experimental, like, hey, here's this branch that does this thing with this, you know, trial version. You don't need to convert the entire world, just like a sufficient number of things of sufficient complexity that it covers like the standard kind of edge cases, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of what I would expect. Like we gathered some amount of data already, uh, you know, whatever uh, proxy. I think Sh Sean tested the, the proxy scenario, and there was a couple other, and it seemed like it ranged from like noticeable to quite small, small to less small. <laughs> yeah, like uh, it, it really depends on um, like how much you're reading in comparison to how big your buffers are and that kind of stuff. Right, there's a lot um, of. But actually, one interesting thing, um, this isn't a PR. I can link you, I don't have it on this computer, but I can link it to you um, after. Well, actually, I actually might be able to pull it up. Is um, a, P, a fix we made to the standard library back a while ago. Yeah, um, I that. that was interesting. Where basically, if you're working in a world where you have to zero your buffers, you can't work with uninitialized memory, it's really easy to screw up subtly and fall off a massive performance cliff. Um, because yeah. you have to get zeroing and if you're not like adaptively resizing, you can do some pretty bad things. 
uh, by accident. Yep, I remember you cited that. Um, but actually, we're, we sort of shifted from talking about, well, where now we're talking about like, how important is it to solve this problem at all, essentially? Right, these measurements that I was asking for earlier and that you brought up are kind of showing the impact of zeroing. Whereas the other question is like, is this a good solution, like buff mute, or do we hit some obstacle when we start trying to really do it? Mm -hmm. Sounds good on paper, right? Um, and it seems like the latter question, I mean, the usual way we solve that is nightly. Like yep. we could conceivably land async stood in night, uh, sorry, async read in stood uh, and uh, unstable states with and, and change the buff mute methods on read that are currently unstable to use this buff mute thing and try to port code to use it, right? Um, mm -hmm. That's that what I'm also because the one, the one nice thing though is that like because Tokyo is, already has its own methods, like then you can just do the like cut a fork, you know, cut a fork of Tokyo with these experiment with this new experimental version and update hyper and other things to that. And it'd be less. Because uh... then you don't need to switch to nightly, all that, you know, and like all that kind of stuff. But yeah. basically, there, there are ways to get like a sufficient amount of experimentation. Um, I guess what I'm saying is we're evaluating, we should clarify what we're evaluating maybe as part of what I'm trying to say. One of them would be, can, does this actually solve the performance problems we think it solves? And how, the other would be like, how ergonomic is it to use? Yeah, uh, I care much more about the second because the first, I think we have enough experience with this. It's like by design, this solves the problem. Right. I also feel that way. It doesn't seem in doubt. Yeah. The only thing that's a little bit unclear is like how much work is it going to be to get everybody to implement these methods properly and not just a little, maybe a bit of a foot gun or something, and especially for the read trade. If we, you know, the defaults are not right. But, yeah. Like figuring out like a good API for that read buff type. Well, I think you're pretty important, especially things around like, I want to read into a VEC and having some adapters around being able to work with a VEC and pat, like construct read buffs from a VEC and do the right thing. Um, like we definitely want an API around that. At the very, yeah, very I was bottom bring that up. of the visualization page, there's some like code examples. Um, yeah. And code working with stack buffers is pretty great looking. Code working with vectors is like not so hot. Yeah, I was going to bring up earlier when we were looking at it, decided not to. to but I really want to be able to give this an and mute back and not think about it and let it deal with right. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, and that seems like that takes a little noodling. It's not well adapted to the RFC process per se. I, mean, I don't know. Well, I, don't, I, don't, I think that's the kind of thing that's best done experimentation. Um, I was trying to figure out if there was anything else to evaluate. I guess it would just be if there's some surprises that, that come up. There we go. Something unanticipated. Okay. It seems like it would be the best scenario if we can all get behind one tree. Like if we don't have a Tokyo async read and async write tree. Uh, that. Yeah, I think we'll definitely be in that world um, where the like the raw trait is the same and they right and then there may be some like tokyo extension traits or whatever um but as long as the core as long as you can use a tcp stream everywhere you know right let me ask you one other question that's like kind of totally different mm -hmm. um one of the things that's come up it's more from a i don't know a libs team point of view or something Thinking a bit bro more broadly, one of the things that I've heard and I think makes sense is using sort of a trait like async read and async write often allows interoperability, but it's kind of the basics, right? You, have a, you can write data, but you can't say things like, what URL does this data come from? Or um, other kind of stuff that you might want to make for a better, better errors or just a better experience in some small, in some way. And, We don't have anything kind of like that in the standard library today. I mean, I think those sort of details come from frameworks or other things. I right? don't even know those concepts necessarily. Um, but is that something you think, how, 
if we were going to try to standardize like higher levels of interoperability, mm -hmm. do you think the standard library would be the place for that? Do you think it would make more sense to have some blessed crates? Those are really the two alternatives I see. Yeah. So like a futures crate, but different. Um, so, I mean, I think in extreme cases, you do want them to be understood like stream. There's no need until generators land for stream to be instead. And there's no technical need for async read async write to be instead. But those are like so fundamentally foundational that they may as well just be in there because like they're the fundamental building blocks of like all IO. Right. Um, but then for other things like more kind of uh, like higher level abstractions, I really think the place for those is just in the ecosystem and not even in like a officially lib sanctioned blessed thing. I'm like generally pretty suspicious of that um, <laughs> because I'm suspicious that like my idea is the best idea that will ever exist. Um, <laughs> yeah, although that's kind of like being blessed doesn't, putting in the standard library makes it pretty hard to, to remove. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Right. Putting well, it in like a crate that we can deprecate. It was blessed. Now it's not. It's not. Yeah. Right. And like we've done that. And like we've done that in the past. Um, but there's always the awkward transition, right? With like time and chrono. Uh, I guess that's kind of a bad example because we just like inherited that from being from it being ejected from the standard library. But yeah. it's a thing where once a thing becomes blessed, there's like a very long tail on people being aware that it was blessed at some point and being confused if they should use it or not. Yeah. I guess an example of something that I think where it might be relevant, I don't know. I think there's a crate that has like HTTP error codes or something mm -hmm. uh, that is distinct from hyper, but kind of created also by Sean. And mm -hmm. I don't know how much it doesn't, f I know when I saw it, it didn't feel, it wasn't obvious to me that this was like, okay to expose in my public APIs, this, uh, this like random crates stuff you know, like error code enum, whereas it would have felt obviously okay if it were a, a lib standard one. Um, yep. Yeah, and like I think like, I do think HTTP is a good example of like one of those kind of pretty, like pretty, pretty foundational interfaces. Um, and yeah, I don't, yeah, like, yeah, like I don't know how to like promote those as like actually this is like a pretty stable thing. Um, I don't know either. It's interesting. It seems like it's gonna be the next question. It comes up once we yeah, get past like, stream and async read and async write. When we're talking about interoperability at the async ecosystem, we're starting to move up to the upper layers then. Uh, and you want to have things like I have my warp framework and I connect it to, you know, my usual examples, run warp on Fuchsia or something or one of them. And yeah, like we've, we've like tried things like this before. Uh, like a long time ago, we like on the lib side, we had this idea of like, the Rust platform or something. I can't remember the name of it, but it was like a collection of like the yeah. super like, law. Rust platform, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, um, and, and in that case, it, like, you know, like the community was like, you know, why are we blessing these random crates? Which I kind of agreed with. Uh, and that's why it's like not clear to me like what. Yeah, although. On, like the official side we can do there. Other than just like. It's changed, oh, right? Right. Like that probably was the right reaction then. It probably is the right reaction now, but there may be a time when it's not the right reaction. Yeah. Um, and maybe the answer is a, sort of like what I just said, because if you don't bless them, then it feels strange <laughs> to use them in your public interfaces. Like somebody has to, there has to be some blessing happening kind of somewhere. Uh, but. Yeah. And it could be a documentation thing, right? Of like HTTP hitting 1.0 and like talking about like, hey, this is designed to be stable for the next, you know, indefinite number of years or you know stuff like that where it talks about like this is a thing that you should be happy you, sh you should be comfortable exposing this stuff right and, and actually that that's not like the platform idea was which i was basically can we can we make the initial give us sort of batteries included experience to using rust uh it was more talking about end user crates in other words so it might have chosen a good web framework to have available without needing to edit your cargo tunnel at all or something. Yeah. This is, this is more like a plumbing layer thing I'm talking about. It mm -hmm. probably isn't what the direct end user cares about. Yeah. And I still think that's a problem for us uh, regardless. I don't know what I think the best solution to it is, but like it may just be we need great docs or something, but 
it's, it's easy to add things to your cargo tunnel, but it's not always easy to know what to add, <laughs> which crate to add, um, that there is even a crate that you could have added. Uh, so I know. Anyway, enough about that. Um, all right, I got all the information I want out of you. <laughs> and it was very helpful and very interesting. Uh, do you have anything you want to talk about that we didn't talk about? Uh, yeah, just that async away is like, I spent the last month and a half or so rewriting our web framework and Rust Postgres, and it's like the most profoundly amazing thing to go from Futures 01 to async await. That is awesome. Um, actually, let me ask just one general open-ended question. I've been sort of assuming that the next step is this traits around stream and async read and async write. Are there other things besides getting GATS to work, which, you know, working on it, that, that are, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> that you think makes, you know, from your experience of porting over, let's say, the, this web framework or whatever, did you think, boy, I wish I had generator syntax or there was some small additions that would have been nice or any other things that make sense to prioritize? Um, GATS would be nice. Uh, the like the async trait crate does a pretty decent job, but like the boxing is not ideal, and there's some places it falls over. Um, uh, having a, having stream like a generator based stream would be great. You still have to do the terrible state machine nightmare if you're writing a custom stream right now. Um, yeah, writing streams. So having the stream trait just lets you do interop, but it seems like writing streams is still going to be futures one oh world until we right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but getting that to a place where you can like, you know, have an async that yields or whatever the syntax would be, would be pretty amazing. Um, and then I think just like, honestly, diagnostics, you know, like sync send questions. Um, Let me ask you a question then, as a random person who cares about diagnostics. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that arose recently and I'm gonna let you go because this is going way too long. Uh, One of the things that arose recently though was we were wrestling with, um, you know, we, we now try, I don't know if you ever encountered them, to give better diagnostics around the case where, oh, let's see, you have some async function and you have some other function and it's like, you know, this is kind of the pattern that happens. Uh, the async, the function foo is creating a future from bar and and that future has to be sent for some reason or another, I guess some more realistic things like task spawn or something. Yep. But, um, but, uh, but the reason it's not send is because of some random variable, usually a mutex guard, but at least that's the example I've often seen. Um, mm -hmm. And that it happens to be alive, or at least we think it's alive over in await. And we now try to give a pretty, Pretty decent error message, I think, where we like show the code of bar and highlight the thing that is causing the problem. It's a little bit tricky, you know, because the error is actually occurring here, but like there's a lot to tell. There's a whole there's a complex story just to try to convey to the user what's going on. But one of the questions that arose was like, what if what if it's not directly in bar, you know, but um, bar is calling bar two and bar two is calling bar three and bar three is where the problem is. Like we can show a sort of stack trace. <laughs> At some point you start to be giving the user quite a lot of information. Um, like if it's a really long stack trace that, that error message might be super long. Um, and we're kind of wrestling with like how much is too much and, and so on. Uh, and maybe we, and I'm curious whether you Maybe you can't answer this question, but whether you encounter situations where you feel like you have definitely wanted like a full stack trace or it just would have been enough to know the leaf function and you can find the path yourself. Or, um. I think a leaf would probably be sufficient for me. Um, yeah, although like, you know, in cases of like types being non-send and non-sync, we do give the, you know, we do give the path, which is super important for them because the non-send thing is always like a star mute void or whatever. Right. Um, yeah, you need the path there. Less so here. Right? Less so here because somehow the function is like more, I guess just because the well, bottom of the path is not as useless as star mute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, right, because like, the thing I care about is like, 
what is the what is the guard I need to drop? Right. And I don't need to know like the call chain to answer that, right? That's the other part of it. Yeah, the change you have to make is in bar three, almost certainly. Like it's probably not that bar two just shouldn't call bar three. Yeah. Uh, would you call I think you'd want to stop at a crate boundary though. Um. Yeah, I think we have to. And you, well, now we actually get spans across crates, so sometimes we can, we can. But it's kind of weird to be like here in some code you don't know about it. Can't edit. Yeah, yeah. I think we already limit this to local def IDs, but if we don't, we should. Um, yeah, I, that's kind of where I was leaning to. That, that's a good point about the actionable place is the leaf. I, I was leaning towards we should give the leaf and maybe at most give like one line, kind of print the stack trace, but not in much detail. Not necessarily yeah, show like where the call occurred, but just. <laughs> yeah, you may as well throw it in there, I guess. Um, I just think like the part I like ninety percent of the time I wouldn't be that confused about why I'm calling why I'm calling that code and through this future or whatever. Yep. It's enough to make me that this is the decision. I think it was probably right, but it's the one and the decision to make async FN lean on like auto trait, like not require send, but lean on auto traits is the one that I'm like most concerned about being potentially the wrong call. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a bummer until the diagnostics become good. Uh, but like, as long as we're not getting like the, this anonymous type that's 16 pages long is not saying. Uh, I'll be happy. We did recently land, like in the like shortly before Christmas, we landed a major improvement there. Uh, so I'd be curious to know if your experience changes, and if not, you should file those. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Talk to you later then. Yeah. See ya. Mm -hmm.